Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 104 and 105, which read as follows. Atahave jitang seyo yata yang itarapaja atadantasa posasa nitang sanya tacharino nevadevo nagandambo namaro saha brahmuna chitang apajitang gaira tataru pasa chantuno which means uh, con con it's actually quite similar to the last one. Conquest of the self is the is better than the conquest of others of other people. For one who has uh, conquered themselves and is constantly uh, restrained. San Sanyata Charino, one who fares restrained or uh, controlled, in the sense of not uh, not giving rise to uncontrolled behavior or, or activity that causes harm to others and that kind of thing. Neva Devo Nagandabo, not an angel nor a Gandaba, which is uh, also another type of angel, I guess. Namaro Sahabrahmuna, not Mara, which is like the evil Satan, nor Brahmas, gods. Jitanga Pajitangaira can turn can turn their victory into defeat. Jitang Apajitang. Apajita is defeat, I believe. Jitang Apajitang means turning def victory into defeat, they will not be able to for such a person. They will not be able to turn the victory of such a person into defeat. So, a great verse shows the power of self-conquest. Simple story. The story goes, there was a Brahmin who came to the Buddha and asked him a question. I guess maybe he was a follower of the Buddha, or he, he understood how worthy the Buddha was, uh, or how wise the Buddha was. And so he came to the. He thought of, he had this question. He wondered to himself whether the the Buddha, whether Buddhas, whether those who are enlightened, know only what is. Uh, of benefit, or do they also know what leads to detriment? So do they only know about gain, or do they know about loss as well? Atta, do they know Atta meva janati udahu anattampi puchisa anattampi? Do they know only what is Atta? Atta means what is of benefit or what is of value, or do they also know what is of Detriment, anatta, which is which is harmful or leads one away from success, leads one away from what is useful, that which is useless or harmful, really. And so he went to ask the Buddha this. I guess he had some idea that the Buddha only taught people good things. He only taught, so everyone was praising how the Buddha's teachings would lead people to good things. And they were talking about how great the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha would teach you, do this, do that. And so he hadn't heard the Buddha talk about, don't do this, don't do that. And so he went to the Buddha, and the Buddha gave him an interesting quote. And I was just having a terrible time with it, because the English is... It's incredible how sloppy they were with it. They translate uh, fierce, fierceness, chandikang, as, the, as moonlight. Which is, which is, well, I mean, it's understandable because Chanda, Chanda would be the moon, but Chanda with the da with the alveopalatial ND, anyway, doesn't mean moon at all, unless there's another version that that confuses the two. But it means ferocity. So the Buddha was, the Buddha says, gives a list of six things, 
And I think I've got them all down. And he says, so he goes and asks the Buddha, do you, do you know about loss as well? And the Buddha says, of course. And he tells him these, uh, he says, Atancha hang brahmana janami anatancha. I know both that which is of benefit and that which is to detriment. And so he taught, he says, please then tell me about uh, what is to detriment. And the Buddha says, well, then listen. And he he gives this this verse, which isn't the Dhammapada verse, but there's this is often the case with these stories. There will be other verses that uh, where they come from exactly we don't know where they've been recorded we don't know, but it's supposed to have been said by the Buddha as well. So he says, Usura Sayang, which means clear. That one's clear. It means sleeping beyond sunrise. So sleeping during the day, when it's time to get up and go to work, one instead stays in bed and doesn't do one's work. Alasyang, laziness, when one is just lazy and doesn't want to do good things. Chandikang means, again, ferocity, so being mean or nasty or cruel. Being, being uh, you know, when people are overbearing and just constantly irritable. And then Diga Sondiyang is an interesting one, but I think, because Diga means long, but Sondiya means... Uh, means addiction to intoxication or, or addiction to drink it usually refers to and maybe, maybe intoxication is better so I think it says something to do with in drinking intoxicating drinks and it may be a corruption but I probably just don't know what it means anyway but the English is terrible it doesn't have any of that what does it say long continued prosperity which is ridiculous Diga is long but Long continued prosperity is not a cause for ruin, except it can make you negligent, I suppose, but that's certainly not what's being said here. And then we've got, I think it's addiction to strong drink. Why? Because these come from the, um, or these are echoed in the, uh, um, the Diganikaya Sutta. The Sigalovada Sutta, the discourse, the Sigalo, Sigala. Sigalovada Sutta talks about these various states that lead to loss, right? And addiction to drink is, of course, one of them. Ekasadana gamanang. So, go, tra I believe, means traveling alone. Which they just translate as going on long journeys, but going on journeys doesn't lead to loss. Going on long journeys alone can lead to problems. In the time of the Buddha, it certainly could, because you could get robbed. It was a big deal if you traveled alone. It wasn't a, just wasn't a good idea. And finally, paradarupasevanang, which means chasing after other people's wives, which was apparently a thing, or is is really a thing. No, people commit adultery all the time. Bad idea leads to loss, leads to disrespect, leads leads to loss of friendship, etc., etc. So he taught these things, and maybe he taught others, but that's the sort of things he taught. Certainly in the Sigalavada Sutta, he taught many other things that are to your detriment. And it's curious, you know, because he doesn't say gambling, and yet gambling is considered one of the things that leads to loss. I don't believe it's in here. If I've translated it correctly, it's not there. And in the Sigalavada Sutta, it's clearly there. And that's interesting because he, the, um, the Brahmin is then impressed and, and says, very good, very good, that's awesome. Well, well spoken, you're really, really a great teacher and you really know what is a benefit and what is a detriment. And then the Buddha asks him, so, Brahman, how do you make your livelihood? And turns out the Brahman makes his this Brahmin makes his livelihood through gambling. That's how he makes a living. I guess by uh, pro he must he must uh, be, uh, a, be sort of one of these people who a con artist, right? Or something like that. How to, to make his I guess. There are professional poker players nowadays. It's a big thing, apparently, to gamble online. I have people who tell me about that, how they do gambling online. 
And uh, so it's interesting that the Buddha didn't include it, but that is common to be very careful not to um, attack a person directly. Right? So if he had brought up gambling, it would have. So there's a little bit. If you, as a Buddhist, you, you 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 it's more curious than this Brahmin probably realized. He doesn't bring it up, uh, but yet he wants to make it clear that gambling is is in there as well, without actually saying, "Oh, gambling is going to lead you to ruin." It's as though uh, he purposefully left it out, or it's it. This story, part of the reason for telling this story, is to. Uh, um, or, or part of the, the meaning behind the story is, is to show that he didn't attack him directly. It's quite curious. Uh, but can be a really important aspect of teaching. So anyway, point is he, he tells him, he tells him that he make, the, the Brahmin says he makes his living by gambling, and the, this is the funny sort of inside joke that here we can kind of smile because uh, we we know what's kind of what's going through the Buddhist mind to some extent that he's uh, he's he he knows that this Brahmin is is on a state of loss and is heading in a bad way anyway uh, and so then the Buddha asks him so who wins when you gamble do you win or does the do your, does your do your opponents win and he said oh well sometimes I win sometimes my opponents win. And then the Buddha says, then the Buddha lays down the law and says, Brahman, that's not a real victory. No. As you can see, that's the nature of victory. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And we have this saying, you win some, you lose some. That's not a really, I mean, on balance, you come out with nothing, right? You never come out ahead. Or it's certainly not guaranteed that you're going to come out ahead. And there must be some other factors. Often people would say, luck is all that allows you to come out ahead. And as we've talked about, of course, it doesn't matter whether you come out ahead or not. When you come out ahead, what happens? Well, you you beget enmity. Your opponents are upset because they've lost. When you win, someone has to lose. That kind of victory is not really, he says, a trifling. Oh, that's how the English translate it. We can't really trust the English now, can we? Uh... Parajayo, yeah, he says that's a that's a low sort of, I believe. Jayo, no, Jayopi, Oti Parajayoti. No, that's a question. Sorry, Brahmana Appamattako, yeah. So it's a trifle. He doesn't say that's a bad kind of victory or that kind of victory is actually leading you to ruin, which in fact it is. He says that's a trifling victory, and he, so he, he, in a roundabout way, he's trying to get this Brahman to see the error of his ways. Know, give, provide him with some friendly advice. The Brahmin did ask, after all, what is, leads to loss, and so he's trying to somehow tell him that his lifestyle does that. And he's, but instead he says, so to be very gentle, he says that's a trifling victory. A real victory is self-victory. Real conquest, that's conquest, conquering yourself. Why? Because that kind of conquest you'll never lose. And so it's poignant in, in relation to this story, the idea of being invincible, because a gambler, uh, uh, the win of a gambler, is always is always subject to threat. You know, the next roll of the dice, the next deal of the cards, could be could change your fortune, could spell ruin. Whereas, and, and much victory is like this: victory in war, victory in business, victory in romance, victory of all kinds, is unpredictable and is unstable, is impermanent. It doesn't last forever. No, it's always subject to the potential of being uh, overdone, overthrown. But that's really the claim that's being made. So this is how, how it relates to our practice, is it's, it's an understanding of, what, of the, the extent and the magnitude of the practice that we're undertaking. I mean, this isn't just stress relief. I was thinking today about uh, advertising the benefits of meditation. And we're probably going to put up posters. Um, and 
it made me think of you know people really really it's really catchy to say mindfulness based stress reduction because it's uh non sectarian it's non religious it's really something that people can it sort of rolls off the tongue but then I thought it's kind of you know petty to say stress reduction because that's not really what we're talking about is it in in Buddhism we go quite it's mindfulness based or it's based on sati but it goes farther than just reducing stress it uproots anything that could possibly cause you stress in the future there's no potential for future stress meaning invi you're invincible and it goes beyond heaven it goes beyond God goes beyond the universe something that goes beyond uh, loss something that can never be taken from you we're talking about inv invincibility how does this come about? It comes about by a person who is atadanta bosa uh, nichang sanyata charino who is who is constantly constantly uh, restrained it's meaning they they never when seeing a form with the eye they never give rise to likes or dislikes they see it as it is and their objective they free themselves from the potential for uh, or they free themselves from from involvement in this game of gain and loss and happiness and suffering it sounds sounds actually quite quite fearsome for people who are in, addicted to pleasure and and who are caught up in this game of of gain and loss so it's something that you do have to um, kind of finesse when you talk to people and people often accuse the, make the make the accusation that such a person would be someone like a zombie right when they are restrained you know, means they are just suppressing their urges which isn't at all the case this is suppressing your urges wouldn't work it's not something as, that is sustainable it's not the true uh, victory true victory is is uh, is uh, invincible imperturbable I was thinking about this today the, the whole idea of the zombie right so we have this idea that a person who doesn't like and dislike things is just like a zombie their, their, their life has no flavor has no meaning but then if you look at people who are caught up if you, ima if you think of how, e how, how the state of mind for a person who's caught up in chasing after things the objects of their desire how much like a zombie they are how unaware they are of their own minds, of their own state, how inflamed the mind becomes with passion and, and hate, and how the mind just in general becomes inflamed and so is subject to greed, anger, and delusion constantly. Sometimes with such intense greed that they will do anything to get what they want, even at the at the detriment to other people, even at the cost of friendship. Hmm. Sometimes uh, give rise to such states of delusion that they uh, alienate all of their friends due to their oppressive, arrogant, uh, conceited nature. The, the level of conceit that we're capable of, the level of arrogance we're capable of, and, and how awful it is. and how harmful it is and uh, anger how we can be so caught up with rage and hatred constantly uh, depressed or angry or, you know, sad afraid all of these negative states it's kind of like a zombie like one of those zombie movies or zombie shows that everyone's watching uh, the evil zombies, how horrific they are. That's kind of what we're talking about. Enlightened people are nothing like that. 
An enlightened one is not is the, the opposite of a zombie. They are awake. They are alive. They never die. They're invincible. And so this is what we're striving for. It's something quite profound. You know, I teach, teach meditation, now teaching at the university, and I teach to all sorts of people, and a lot of people are just in it for stress reduction, stress relief. And so it kind of pulls you in, and you start to realize, oh, it goes a little bit deeper, and, and you end up down the rabbit hole, so to speak, where uh, you, you don't recognize the world around you anymore. Your whole world changes. I mean, it's not like it's a trap or something. It's just the sweater starts to unravel. You, you, the whole illusion uh, that you built up around yourself and uh, who you thought you were starts to unravel and you see how asleep you've been. You're like a sleepwalker, like a zombie. That's how it should be. That's how it really is in meditation. You start to wake up and see, oh, I've got these problems. My mind has greed, my mind has anger, my mind has delusion. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. And so you start to do the hard, the hard work of changing that. That's what we do in meditation. So, and that is the highest victory. It's uh, a victory that no one can take from you. That's the point of this verse, and it's very well said, as are all the things the Buddha said. So, something that we should appreciate and remember. Give us confidence that what we're aiming for is not something simple. It's not just a hobby that you can pick up and put down. It's something that really and truly changes your life, transforms you, wake, wakes you up and helps you rise above your troubles so that even though the situation may not change no matter what the situation is you are you are above it you are beyond it so that's the teaching for tonight it's verses 104 and 105 we're almost a quarter of the way through the dhammapada i think when we get to 108 that'll be one quarter of the way so thank everyone Thank you all for tuning in. I'm wishing you all the best on your path to invincibility. Be well.